Hey, hey there, Canadian Wealth Secret Secrets. It's Kyle from the Canadian Wealth Secrets podcast, and I'm here to help you uh, understand, especially those incorporated business owners. Today, we're going to be talking to those with active income, so those with operating companies. We're going to talk a little bit about the RRSP uh, or maybe even an IPP, uh, but we're actually going to talk about something a little bit different, a little unique. Uh, some For some of you, IPPs may be unique, but we're going to talk about what might be a better option for you than the RRSP, the IPP, or some of the other strategies that might be out there with your company. So let's get started here. I'm going to go ahead and share uh, a little drawing here. So I'm not an artist, but I'm going to do my best to help uh, us with some understanding. So first off, we're going to talk about here's you. We're going to assume you're 100% shareholder. However, you don't have to be. You could be 50-50 with you and a partner, you and a spouse. You could be thirds. It doesn't really matter. But today, we're just going to keep it simple. And you personally own this operating company. Another option could be that this is a holding company above here, and then you own shares of the holding company. We're not going to get into that today. All Everything we're talking about here today would apply in that situation first. But first and foremost, let's make sure that we understand what's going on. When I earn active income inside my operating company, so this means we're not earning investment income primarily, we're actually doing the, we're doing active work, right? So we're earning active income. On that first 500,000, we get a business, small business deduction, which makes here in Ontario, I'll talk in Ontario, everywhere else is a little bit cheaper. Uh, so Ontario's um, the, the highest currently anyway, as I record this, but you're going to get charged 12.2%. Okay. So that's not bad, but the problem is, is that's money charged to the company um, on net operating income and you still don't have it in your personal pocket. So that's a problem, right? Um, anything above that is going to be 26 and a half percent, uh, I believe as recording this video here. So anything above that, um, so we're going to kind of play in this land for now. However, if you're in this land, this would still apply. Everything still makes sense. This is a large tax bracket. And of course, if you're paying all of that out, that's going to be problematic for you as a shareholder. So for the summer, we're thinking about what do I do with this money, especially if I'm thinking about maybe a retirement plan. The most common thought is, well, if I could just like take some money back myself, I'll take money back and I'm going to take that as income. And then I'm going to send it to my RRSP, okay? So I send it to an RRSP. Now, this is like a new jail. You have a jail here. you got a jail there. You're taking this money. The problem is, is that you have tax to deal with. In order to open up a room in the RRSP, you're going to actually have to have a salary or you're going to take it as a dividend. You already have RSP room for whatever reason, other, other salary jobs that you had, or maybe you took a salary from your company previously. Either way, you're going to have tax. And the challenge is, is that if I'm taking a small amount, then the tax is obviously not going to be super punitive. If I take a salary, that's going to be a deduction to the company, right? So it's going to actually, I'm not going to pay tax in the company. If I take a dividend, I pay tax in the company and I pay a dividend tax personally. All right. We've talked in, in uh, episodes of the podcast about, you know, sort of uh, the, how do you navigate that, um, you know, with taxation. However, the problem with an RSP is that you can actually only contribute um, up to a maximum of 18 percent of your of your salary or uh, under it's actually under twenty eight thousand per year. So that actually doesn't give you a lot of room each year, but then it also doesn't give you a great deduction unless you're in one of the higher tax brackets. So if I'm taking 300,000 out of my out of my company each year as a salary, I'm paying, you know, a, a, a substantial amount. I'm paying on average in the low 30% bra you know, range on the entire amount or I'm in the marginal tax bracket of over 53% here in Ontario. So sure, I'm going to get half of 28,000 back but I'm still paying about 100000 in taxes personally. So that's a problem. Um, and my RSP might not get, you know, if I'm taking 300 out or taking 200 out, my RSP might not get large enough over time in order to make this make sense. Uh, the other option is, okay, uh, I could, instead of going RSP, I could set up what we call an IPP, which is an individual pension plan. Um, now, this is nice because it's creditor protected, okay? But the problem is this is expensive to set up. And 
um, while you can contribute more than this amount each year, so there's some benefits there, they're very expensive to set up, they're very expensive to maintain. Now, if it's a significant amount of money in there, then the costs are gonna make sense. The problem in both of these cases though, is that, hey, I can grow a big RSP or I can grow a big IPP, but the problem is when it comes back, guess what I have to do? I've gotta pay tax, and if I do it the same thing here, I'm gonna to have to pay tax on that as well. Okay, so we're gonna put these on pause for now. We're not saying that you should completely melt those down or not use them at all, but let's talk about how we can do this a little bit better. So I'm going to introduce this idea, same thought, same thought process, but now we're gonna go like this and we're gonna say, okay, here's my operating company. We're gonna assume that you have a million dollars of retained earnings. That means that you already had paid taxes on that income. If it was in one year, that means you earned more than a million dollars. You got taxed on it. Half of the, uh, you got taxed on the first 500,000 at this rate. And then anything above 500,000, you got taxed at that rate. And then net, you had a million left. All right, and this money is still stuck in this company. Now the one option I could do, I could take this money, I could send it off to say an IPP or I could send it straight to like a wealth account. I could go to, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, big wealth, uh, one of the big banks, one of the big wealth managers, any of those. I could do those things and I can buy growth stocks. Heck, I could start buying real estate with this money inside the corporation. The problem is I still don't have any money over here. The challenge is, is that these dollars at some point in the future, a shareholder is going to have to pay tax on them if they are not expensed away in the company. Meaning if they stay as retained earnings and I don't have enough expenses to essentially blow all this money as an expense, I'm never gonna see that money as a shareholder without paying tax. Now I'm sure you know, if I was to take out this $1 million, if I take it out as a salary, I'm basically saying goodbye to half of it. If I take it out as a dividend, I'm gonna say goodbye to about 40% of it, okay? So this $1 million puts 600,000 in my pocket if I take it out all at once. Of course, some people would say, well, don't do that. Take it out in smaller chunks. Take it out, you know, let's say you take out uh, 100,000 or 150. Okay, so you pay, you know, 28% total or, th you know, 30% uh, on average taking that money out. Okay, that's not as bad, but imagine there was a bucket that we could use that's going to help us to get these retained earnings out over time. And there really is, there's one last bucket that we can leverage and that we can use, and it's actually called life insurance, all right? And inside the corporation, we can use corporate tax dollars to purchase the same life insurance that we could buy personally. Now we're not talking about the actual term life insurance that you're renting. We're actually talking about permanent life insurance. So I could buy a permanent life policy and the corporation's gonna own this policy and with it, it's gonna have a death benefit. Okay, so there's this big death benefit. Whoops. And there's also something else. There's this, what we'll call a cash value. Now, this isn't to scale by any means, but if I was to put money into this big bucket, basically the money that goes in is buying me death benefit. And because it's a permanent policy, it is guaranteed to pay out. Now, the other thing that's really important is that at the same time, every dollar that I put in to this policy creates more cash value. For those real estate investors out there, it's like you're building equity in this home. So if you think about the death benefit, down the road, it is going to pay out. I don't know if anyone's ever told you this. You are gonna pass away. So when you do, that death benefit's gonna pay out. And as I put more money into it, the death benefit's going to grow over time, just like a home might appreciate, right? So this is an appreciating asset and the cash value is going to grow. And the longer I live, the closer the cash value is going to get to the actual total death benefit. Okay, so this is going to rapidly grow. This is gonna continue growing, but the cash value is gonna gain and gain and gain on it because guess what? There's an average age of death for males and females here in Canada, right? Depending on your health status and so forth. Why this is important is because the actual death benefit 
and I'm going to call it the net death benefit here because I, I don't want to talk about the million dollars here. This death benefit, if I put a million dollars in over, let's say, a 10-year period, let's say I put in 100000 per year. I'm going to use an easy scenario. So I do this year one. I do it year two. I do it year three. I do it year four every year for 10 years to get this 100000 in to this policy. Okay, and I'm going to do that for 10 years. I've now taken a million dollars of retained earnings. We're assuming this company doesn't earn any more active income, so probably not a real scenario. However, some clients have this issue, or not issue, but they, you know, they aren't earning any more income, but they still have retained earnings. So you take this million dollars and we fund this policy for 10 years, right? This cash value is going to grow. The death benefit that might be associated with a million dollars might be, I'm just going to throw it out there and say, uh, let's call it $2 million right away in year one. As I keep funding this thing, that's going to grow. The cash value is not going to start at 100000 It might be somewhere like 85000 to start. And people say, well, that seems weird. Why isn't it worth 100000 Well, guess what? We're guaranteeing that if you die, we're going to pay out this massive amount. So like you know, 2,500% or some ridiculous number in year one. In year two, that number is going to go up. Now I've put 200 in. By the time I get to about year five, the way we design these policies, you're going to notice that your cash value is going to be greater than the 500 that's been put in there. And it's going to keep growing and compounding. The beauty is it's tax-free. When this death benefit pays out, it's going to pay out tax-free net of the premium you put in into the shareholders. Now, 2 million is probably, uh, by the time you get to year 10, 2 million is going to be a lot more. But let's look at the 2 million scenario. If let's say I die in the first year, I'm going to have a little, a little uh, more than 1.9 million that can come out to shareholders tax free. Now, for some of you, you're thinking to yourself, well, that seems silly. Why would I want to do that? That's going to help a different shareholder. Because now, remember, this is going to be on the life of this shareholder. This shareholder is now gone. And now there's a new shareholder who's in there. Maybe it's a son. Maybe it's a daughter. Maybe it's a spouse. So it's actually going to go to this person, not to you. So how does this help me out? Well, this helps the shareholder, of course, down the road. This is great for legacy. But that's not why we're going to do it. What we're going to be able to do is we're actually going to use this cash value in the meantime as we grow the policy. We're going to use it and we're going to leverage against it so that we can buy additional assets. Now, you can buy the assets inside the operating company, but I would argue that you'd probably be better off setting up some sort of hold co. The hold co should probably own the operating company, but we can talk about that some other time. And you can start buying assets wherever you want by loaning this money across to this company and growing this asset as cash flow comes back, we can pay back the loan and let this thing grow and compound. Now we have two compounding machines going on over here and you are not paying any taxes. Eventually, as this policy grows over time, we're going to grow this policy so that this cash value is large enough where that cash value can then be leveraged and we can start considering leveraging it for personal income. And we're going to do that via a personal loan, not a company loan, not a loan to the company, but you're going to get a loan personally because guess what? You are the shareholder of this company and of all these assets and banks love when they look at the balance sheet of your corporation and they see something as easy to leverage against as a permanent life insurance policy. So this is the only tool that's going to give you the long-term exit strategy for these retained earnings in a tax efficient manner. If you had a million, they'd be 600,000. Now you're gonna get 1.9 coming out if you died in year one. If you died in year 30, that 2 million is gonna be a whole lot bigger. So you put a million in, that 2 million is gonna be a lot, many millions more and it's gonna come out tax-free to the shareholders. In the meantime, we're gonna use this as a leveraging tool so that we can buy other assets and we can then slowly but surely 
take personal loans to help us out with lifestyle because guess what? On a personal loan, there is no tax. Yes, there is interest. And yes, right now we're in a high interest rate environment. So let's say prime. If prime is now 6.95%, I like that more than 40% in taxes or 53% or whatever that tax rate might be for you when you are trying to deal with these retained earnings and you're trying to figure out how much should I take out to stuff this RSP? How much should I put into an IPP and, and pay to an IPP to try to maintain that IPP? How's this all gonna work? Oh, and then I gotta get taxed on the way out. This entire bucket gets taxed if I pass on and my spouse passes on, the entire bucket gets taxed. Not so fun. Not the same case in an IPP, but it's still stuck in here. In this particular case, we're creating you an exit plan for this death benefit and an opportunity for you to use leverage as a means to give yourself personal income. Now, for those people who have quite a bit of retained earnings every year, so let's say you have $500,000 of retained uh, earnings each year and you fund a policy with all 500,000 every single year, we have a strategy and a structure that will allow you to get the same cash flow as the after-tax amount that you would get on your 250. So let's call it, you know, $280,000 because that would have been your after-tax cash flow. And we can actually provide you with almost $200,000 extra to reinvest in any asset class that you'd like afterwards. So if that's you, you're in an advanced, you know, sort of strategy where we're going to use a leverage now strategy. However, for everyone else that has, we'll call it less than 200,000 in retained earnings per year, even if you have 60,000 in retained earnings, by learning the strategy and being able to build a policy in a tax efficient, tax free way, you'll be able to help create legacy in a tax efficient manner and you're going to create personal income later for you in a tax efficient manner. So if this is of interest to you, you should be booking a call with us and we'll hop on. We'll talk about your scenario and see is a permanent life insurance policy or, or permanent life insurance strategy a good fit for you as you try to minimize taxes and maximize the amount of assets that you're accumulating over your lifetime. All right. Once again, it's Kyle. Thanks for hanging around. And let me know, hit that reply button if you watch to the end and if you're interested in learning more. We'll chat soon.